Section 15, Celebrated Crimes, Volume 5, by Alexander Dumas. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tom Denham. Celebrated Crimes, Volume 5, by Alexander Dumas. Section 15. La Constantin. Chapter 2. In 1658, at the corner of the streets Gilles Le Coeur and Le Huropois, the site of the latter now being occupied by the Quai des Augustins as far as Pont Saint Michel, stood the great mansion which Francis I had bought and fitted up for the Duchesse d'Etampes. It was at this period, if not in ruins, at least beginning to show the ravages of time. Its rich interior decorations had lost their splendour, and become antiquated. Fashion had taken up its abode in the Marais near the Place Royale, and it was thither that profligate women and celebrated beauties now enticed the humming swarm of old rakes and young libertines. Not one of them all would have thought of residing in the mansion, or even in the quarter wherein the king's mistress had once dwelt. It would have been a step downward in the social scale, and equivalent to a confession that their charms were falling in the public estimation. Still the old palace was not empty. It had, on the contrary, several tenants. Like the provinces of Alexander's empire, its vast suites of rooms had been subdivided, and so neglected was it by the gay world that people of the commonest description strutted about with impunity, where once the proudest nobles had been glad to gain admittance. There, in semi-isolation and despoiled of her greatness, lived Angélique Louise de Guerchi, formerly companion to Mademoiselle de Pons, and then maid of honour to Anne of Austria. Her love intrigues, and the scandals they gave rise to, had led to her dismissal from court. Not that she was a greater sinner than many who remained behind, only she was unlucky enough or stupid enough to be found out. Her admirers were so indiscreet, that they had not left her a shred of reputation, and in a court where a cardinal is the lover of a queen, a hypocritical appearance of decorum is indispensable to success. So Angélique had to suffer for the faults she was not clever enough to hide. Unfortunately for her, her income went up and down with the number and wealth of her admirers, so when she left the court all her possessions consisted of a few articles she had gathered together out of the wreck of her former luxury, and these she was now selling one by one to procure the necessaries of life, while she looked back from afar with an envious eye at the brilliant world from which she had been exiled, and longed for better days. All hope was not at an end for her, by a strange law which does not speak well for human nature, vice finds success easier to attain than virtue. There is no courtesan, no matter how low she has fallen, who cannot find a dupe ready to defend against the world an honour of which no vestige remains. A man who doubts the virtue of the most virtuous woman, who shows himself inexorably severe, when he discovers the lightest inclination to falter in one whose conduct has hitherto been above reproach, will stoop and pick up out of the gutter a blighted and tarnished reputation, and protect and defend it against all slights, and devote his life to the attempt to restore lustre to the unclean thing dulled by the touch of many fingers. In her days of prosperity, Commander de Jarre and the king's treasurer had both fluttered round Mademoiselle de Guerchy, and neither had fluttered in vain. Short as was the period necessary to overcome her scruples, 
in as short a period it dawned on the two candidates for her favour that each had a successful rival in the other and that however potent as a reason for surrender the doubloons of the treasurer had been the personal appearance of the commander had proved equally cogent as both had felt for her only a passing fancy and not a serious passion their explanations with each other led to no quarrel between them silently and simultaneously they withdrew from her circle without even letting her know they had found her out but quite determined to revenge themselves on her should a chance ever offer however other affairs of a similar nature had intervened to prevent their carrying out this laudable intention jeannin had laid siege to a more inaccessible beauty who had refused to listen to his sighs for less than thirty crowns paid in advance and de jard had become quite absorbed by his adventure with the convent boarder at la raquette and the business of that young stranger whom he passed off as his nephew mademoiselle de guerchi had never seen them again and with her it was out of sight out of mind at the moment when she comes into our story she was weaving her toils round a certain duc de vitry whom she had seen at court but whose acquaintance she had never made and who had been absent when the scandalous occurrence which led to her disgrace came to light he was a man of from twenty-five to twenty-six years of age who idled his life away his courage was undoubted and being as credulous as an old libertine he was ready to draw his sword at any moment to defend the lady whose cause he had espoused should any insolent slanderer dare to hint there was a smirch on her virtue being deaf to all reports he seemed one of those men expressly framed by heaven to be the consolation of fallen women such a man as in our times a retired opera dancer or a superannuated professional beauty would welcome with open arms he had only one fault he was married it is true he neglected his wife according to the custom of the time and it is probably also true that his wife cared very little about his infidelities but still she was an insurmountable obstacle to the fulfilment of mademoiselle de guerchi's hopes who but for her might have looked forward to one day becoming a duchess for about three weeks however at the time we are speaking of the duke had neither crossed her threshold nor written he had told her he was going for a few days to normandy where he had large estates but had remained absent so long after the date he had fixed for his return that she began to feel uneasy what could be keeping him some new flame perhaps the anxiety of the lady was all the more keen that until now nothing had passed between them but looks of languor and words of love the duke had laid himself and all he possessed at the feet of angelique and angelique had refused his offer a too prompt surrender would have justified the reports so wickedly spread against her and made wise by experience she was resolved not to compromise her future as she had compromised her past but while playing at virtue she had also to play at disinterestedness and her pecuniary resources were consequently almost exhausted she had proportioned the length of her resistance to the length of her purse and now the prolonged absence of her lover threatened to disturb the equilibrium which she had established between her virtue and her money so it happened that the cause of the lovelorn duc de vitry was in great peril just at the moment when de jard and jeannin resolved to approach the fair one anew she was sitting lost in thought pondering in all good faith on the small profit it was to a woman to be virtuous when she heard voices in the antechamber 
Then her door opened, and the king's treasurer walked in. As this interview, and those which follow, took place in the presence of witnesses, we are obliged to ask the reader to accompany us for a time to another part of the same house. We have said there were several tenants. Now the person who occupied the rooms next to those in which Mademoiselle de Guerchi lived was a shopkeeper's widow called Rapailly, who was owner of one of the thirty-two houses which then occupy the bridge Saint-Michel. They had all been constructed at the owner's cost in return for a lease for ever. The widow Rapailly's avowed age was forty, but those who knew her longest added another ten years to that. So to avoid error, let us say she was forty-five. She was a solid little body, rather stouter than was necessary for beauty. Her hair was black, her complexion brown, her eyes prominent and always moving, lively, active, and if one yielded to her whims, exacting beyond measure but until then buxom and soft, and inclined to pet and spoil whoever for the moment had arrested her volatile fancy. Just as we make her acquaintance, this happy individual was a certain Maître Quennebert, a notary of Saint-Denis, and the comedy played between him and the widow was an exact counterpart of the one going on in the rooms of Mademoiselle de Guerchy, except that the roles were inverted, for while the lady was as much in love as the Duc de Vitry, the answering devotion professed by the notary was as insincere as the disinterested attachment to her lover displayed by the whilom maid of honour. Maître Quennebert was still young and of attractive appearance, but his business affairs were in a bad way. For long he had been pretending not to understand the marked advances of the widow, and he treated her with a reserve and respect she would fain have dispensed with, and which sometimes made her doubt of his love. But it was impossible for her as a woman to complain, so she was forced to accept with resignation the persistent and unwelcome consideration with which he surrounded her. Maître Quennebert was a man of common sense and much experience, and had formed a scheme which he was prevented from carrying out by an obstacle which he had no power to remove. He wanted, therefore, to gain time, for he knew that the day he gave the susceptible widow a legal right over him, he would lose his independence. A lover, to whose prayers the adored one remains deaf too long, is apt to draw back in discouragement. But a woman whose part is restricted to awaiting those prayers, and answering with a yes or no, necessarily learns patience. Maître Quennebert would therefore have felt no anxiety as to the effect of his dilatoriness on the widow, were it not for the existence of a distant cousin of the late Monsieur Rapailly, who was also paying court to her, and that with a warmth much greater than had hitherto been displayed by himself. This fact, in view of the state of the notary's affairs, forced him at last to display more energy. To make up lost ground and to outdistance his rival once more, he now began to dazzle the widow with fine phrases and delight her with compliments. But to tell the truth, all this trouble was superfluous. He was beloved, and with one fond look he might have won pardon for far greater neglect. An hour before the treasurer's arrival there had been a knock at the door of the old house, and Maître Quennebert, curled, pomaded, and prepared for conquest, had presented himself at the widow's. She received him with a more languishing air than usual, and shot such arrows at him from her eyes that to escape a fatal wound he pretended to give way by degrees to deep sadness. The widow, 
becoming alarmed, asked with tenderness, "'What ails you this evening?' He rose, feeling he had nothing to fear from his rival, and being master of the field, might henceforth advance or recede as seemed best for his interests. "'What ails me?' he repeated, with a deep sigh. "'I might deceive you, might give you a misleading answer, but to you I cannot lie. I am in great trouble, and how to get out of it I don't know.' "'But tell me what it is,' said the widow, standing up in her turn. Maître Kennebert took three long strides, which brought him to the far end of the room, and asked, "'Why do you want to know? You can't help me. My trouble is of a kind a man does not generally confide to women.' "'What is it? An affair of honour? "'Yes.' "'Good God! You are going to fight!' she exclaimed, trying to seize him by the arm. "'You are going to fight!' "'Ah, if it were nothing worse than that,' said Kennebert, pacing up and down the room. "'But you need not be alarmed. It is only a money trouble. I lent a large sum a few months ago to a friend. But the knave has run away and left me in the lurch. It was trust money, and must be replaced within three days. But where am I to get two thousand francs?' "'Yes, that is a large sum, and not easy to raise at such short notice. I shall be obliged to have recourse to some Jew who will drain me dry, but I must save my good name at all costs.' Madame Rapailly gazed at him in consternation. Maître Kennebert, divining her thought, hastened to add, "'I have just one-third of what is needed.' "'Only one-third?' With great care, and by scraping together all I possess, I can make up eight hundred livres. But may I be damned in the next world, or punished as a swindler in this, and one's as bad as the other to me, if I can raise one farthing more. But suppose someone should lend you the twelve hundred francs, what then? Pardieu, I should accept them, cried the notary as if he had not the slightest suspicion whom she could mean. "'Do you happen to know any one, my dear Madame Rapailly?' The widow nodded affirmatively, at the same time giving him a passionate glance. "'Tell me quick the name of this delightful person, and I shall go to him to-morrow morning. You don't know what a service you are rendering me and I was so near not telling you of the fix I was in, lest you should torment yourself uselessly. Tell me his name. Can you not guess it? How should I guess it? Think well. Does no one occur to you? No, no one, said Kennebert, with the utmost innocence. Have you no friends? One or two? Would they not be glad to help you? They might but I have mentioned the matter to no one. To no one? Except you. Well? Well, Madame Rapailly, I hope I don't understand you. It's not possible. You would not humiliate me. Come, come, it's a riddle, and I am too stupid to solve it. I give it up. Don't tantalize me any longer. Tell me the name. The widow... Somewhat abashed by this exhibition of delicacy on the part of Maître Canevere, blushed, cast down her eyes, and did not venture to speak. As the silence lasted some time, it occurred to the notary that he had been perhaps too hasty in his supposition, and he began to cast round for the best means of retrieving his blunder. "'You do not speak,' he said. I see it was all a joke. No, said the widow, at last in a timid voice. It was no joke. I was quite in earnest. But the way you take things is not very encouraging. What do you mean? Pray, do you imagine that I can go on while you glare at me with that angry frown puckering your forehead, as if you had someone before you who had tried to insult you? A sweet smile chased the frown from the notary's brow. 
encouraged by the suspension of hostilities, Madame Rapailly, with sudden boldness, approached him, and pressing one of his hands in both her own, whispered, "'It is I who am going to lend you the money.' He repulsed her gently, but with an air of great dignity, and said, "'Madame, I thank you, but I cannot accept.' "'Why can't you?' At this he began to walk round and round the room, while the widow, who stood in the middle, turned as upon a pivot, keeping him always in view. This circus-ring performance lasted some minutes before Kennebert stood still and said, "'I cannot be angry with you, Madame Rapailly. I know your offer was made out of the kindness of your heart, but I must repeat that it is impossible for me to accept it. "'There you go again. I don't understand you at all. Why can't you accept? What harm would it do?' "'If there were no other reason, because people might suspect I had confided my difficulties to you in the hope of help.' "'And supposing you did, what then?' "'People speak hoping to be understood. You wouldn't have minded asking anyone else.' "'So you really think I did come in that hope? Mon Dieu, I don't think—' anything at all that you don't want. It was I who dragged the confidence from you by my questions. I know that very well. But now that you have told me your secret, how can you hinder me from sympathising with you, from desiring to aid you? When I learnt your difficulty, ought I to have been amused and gone into fits of laughter? What? It's an insult to be in a position to render you a service— "'That's a strange kind of delicacy.' "'Are you astonished that I should feel so strongly about it?' "'Nonsense! Do you still think I meant to offend you? I look on you as the most honourable man in the world. If any one were to tell me that he had seen you commit a base action, I should reply that it was a lie. Does that satisfy you?' But suppose they got hold of it in the city, suppose it were reported that Maître Quennevert had taken money from Madame de Rapailly, would it be the same as if they said Maître Quennevert had borrowed twelve hundred livres from Monsieur Robert or some other businessman? I don't see what difference it could make, but I do. What then? It's not easy to express, but— but you exaggerate both the service and the gratitude you ought to feel. I think I know why you refuse. You're ashamed to take it as a gift, aren't you? Yes, I am. Well, I'm not going to make you a gift. Borrow twelve hundred livres from me. For how long do you want the money? I really don't know how soon I can repay you. Let's say a year— and reckon the interest. Sit down there, you baby, and write out a promissory note. Maître Quennebert made some further show of resistance, but at last yielded to the widow's importunity. It is needless to say that the whole thing was a comedy on his part, except that he really needed the money. But he did not need it to replace a sum of which a faithless friend had robbed him, but to satisfy his own creditors, who, out of all patience with him, were threatening to sue him, and his only reason for seeking out Madame de Rapailly was to take advantage of her generous disposition towards himself. His feigned delicacy was intended to induce her to insist so urgently that in accepting he should not fall too much in her esteem but should seem to yield to force. And his plan met with complete success, for at the end of the transaction he stood higher than ever in the opinion of his fair creditor, on account of the noble sentiments he had expressed. The note was written out in legal form, and the money counted down on the spot. "'How glad I am!' said she then, while Kennebert still kept up some pretence of delicate embarrassment. 
although he could not resist casting a stolen look at the bag of crowns lying on the table beside his cloak. "'Do you intend to go back to Saint-Denis to-night?' Even had such been his intention, the notary would have taken very good care not to say so, for he foresaw the accusations of imprudence that would follow, the enumeration of the dangers by the way, and it was quite on the cards even that, having thus aroused his fears, his fair hostess should in deference to them offer him hospitality for the night, and he did not feel inclined for an indefinitely prolonged tete-a-tete. "'No,' he said, "'I am going to sleep at Maître Terrasson's, Rue des Poitevins. I have sent him word to expect me, but although his house is only a few yards distant, I must leave you earlier than I would have wished on account of this money. "'Will you think of me?' "'How can you ask?' replied Kennebert, with a sentimental expression. "'You have compelled me to accept the money, but I shall not be happy till I have repaid you. Suppose this loan should make us fall out. You may be quite sure that if you don't pay when the bill falls due, I shall have recourse to the law.' "'Oh, I know that very well. I shall enforce all my rights as a creditor.' I expect nothing else. I shall show no pity. And the widow gave a saucy laugh and shook her finger at him. Madame Rapailly, said the notary, who was most anxious to bring this conversation to an end, dreading every moment that it would take a languishing tone, Madame Rapailly, will you add to your goodness by granting me one more favour? What is it? The gratitude that is simulated is not difficult to bear, but genuine, sincere gratitude such as I feel is a heavy burden, as I can assure you. It is much easier to give than to receive. Promise me, then, that from now till the year is up there shall be no more reference between us to this money, and that we shall go on being good friends as before. Leave it to me to make arrangements to acquit myself honourably of my obligations towards you. I need say no more. Till a year's up, mum's the word. It shall be as you desire, Maître Kennebert, answered Madame Rapailly, her eyes shining with delight. It was never my intention to lay you under embarrassing obligations, and I leave it all to you. "'Do you know that I am beginning to believe in presentiments?' "'You becoming superstitious? Why, may I ask?' "'I refused to do a nice little piece of ready-money business this morning.' "'Did you?' "'Yes, because I had a sort of feeling that made me resist all temptation to leave myself without cash. Imagine, I received a visit to-day from a great lady who lives in this house— in the suite of apartments next to mine. What is her name? Mademoiselle de Guerchi. And what did she want with you? She called in order to ask me to buy for four hundred livres some of her jewels which are well worth six hundred, for I understand such things, or should I prefer it to lend her that sum and keep the jewels as security? It appears that Mademoiselle is in great straits. De Guerchi, do you know the name? I think I have heard it. They say she has had a stormy past, and has been greatly talked of. But then half of what one hears is lies. Since she came to live here she has been very quiet. No visitors except one, a nobleman, a duke. Wait a moment, what's his name? the duc duc de vitry and for over three weeks even he hasn't been near her i imagine from this absence that they have fallen out and that she is beginning to feel the want of money you seem to be intimately acquainted with this young woman's affairs indeed i am and yet i never spoke to her till this morning how do you get your information then 
by chance. The room adjoining this, and one of those she occupies, were formerly one large room, which is now divided into two by a partition wall covered with tapestry. But in the two corners the plaster has crumbled away with time, and one can see into the room through slits in the tapestry without being seen oneself. Are you inquisitive? Not more than you, Madame Rapailly. Come with me. Someone knocked at the street door a few moments ago. There's no one else in the house likely to have visitors at this hour. Perhaps her admirer has come back. If so, we are going to witness a scene of recrimination or reconciliation. How delightful! Although he was not leaving the widow's lodgings, Maître Kennebert took up his hat and cloak, and the blessed bag of crown pieces, and followed Madame Rapailly on tiptoe, who on her side moved as slowly as a tortoise, and as lightly as she could. They succeeded in turning the handle of the door into the next room without making much noise. Shh! breathed the widow softly. Listen! They are speaking! She pointed to the place where he would find a peephole in one corner of the room, and crept herself towards the corresponding corner. Kennebert, who was by no means anxious to have her at his side, motioned to her to blow out the light. This being done, he felt secure, for he knew that in the intense darkness which now enveloped them, she could not move from her place without knocking against the furniture between them, so he glued his face to the partition. An opening just large enough for one eye allowed him to see everything that was going on in the next room. Just as he began his observations, the treasurer at Mademoiselle de Guerchi's invitation was about to take a seat near her, but not too near for perfect respect. Both of them were silent, and appeared to labour under great embarrassment at finding themselves together, and explanations did not readily begin. The lady had not an idea of the motive of the visit, and her quondam lover feigned the emotion necessary to the success of his undertaking. Thus Maître Kennebert had full time to examine both, and especially Angélique. The reader will doubtless desire to know what was the result of the notary's observation. End of section 15 Reading by Tom Denham Section 16 of Celebrated Crimes, Volume 5 by Alexander Dumas This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tom Denham Celebrated Crimes, Volume 5, by Alexander Dumas Section 16 La Constantin, Chapter 3 Angélique Louise de Guerchi was a woman of about twenty-eight years of age, tall, dark, and well-made. The loose life she had led had, it is true, somewhat staled her beauty, marred the delicacy of her complexion, and coarsened the naturally elegant curves of her figure. But it is such women who, from time immemorial, have had the strongest attraction for profligate men. It seems as if dissipation destroyed the power to perceive true beauty, and the man of pleasure must be aroused to admiration by a bold glance and a meaning smile, and will only seek satisfaction along the trail left by vice. Louise Angélique was admirably adapted for her way of life, not that her features wore an expression of shameless effrontery, or that the words that passed her lips bore habitual testimony to the disorders of her existence, but that under a calm and sedate demeanour there lurked a secret and 
indefinable charm. Many other women possessed more regular features, but none of them had a greater power of seduction. We must add that she owed that power entirely to her physical perfections, for except in regarding to the devices necessary to her calling, she showed no cleverness, being ignorant, dull, and without inner resources of any kind. As her temperament led her to share the desires she excited, she was really incapable of resisting an attack conducted with skill and ardour, and if the Duc de Vitry had not been so madly in love, which is the same as saying that he was hopelessly blind, silly, and dense to everything around him, he might have found a score of opportunities to overcome her resistance. We have already seen that she was so straitened in money matters that she had been driven to try to sell her jewels that very morning. Jeannin was the first to break silence. "'You are astonished at my visit, I know, my charming Angelique, but you must excuse my thus appearing so unexpectedly before you. The truth is, I found it impossible to leave Paris without seeing you once more.' "'Thank you for your kind remembrance,' said she, "'but I did not at all expect it. "'Come, come, you are offended with me.' She gave him a glance of mingled disdain and resentment, but he went on in a timid, wistful tone. "'I know that my conduct must have seemed strange to you, and I acknowledge that nothing can justify a man for suddenly leaving the woman he loves.' I do not dare to say the woman who loves him, without a word of explanation. But, dear Angelique, I was jealous. Jealous, she repeated incredulously. I tried my best to overcome the feeling, and I hid my suspicions from you. Twenty times I came to see you bursting with anger and, and determined to overwhelm you with reproaches, but at the sight of your beauty— I forgot everything but that I loved you. My suspicions dissolved before a smile. One word from your lips charmed me into happiness. But when I was again alone, my terrors revived. I saw my rivals at your feet, and rage possessed me once more. Ah, you never knew how devotedly I loved you. She let him speak without interruption. Perhaps— the same thought was in her mind as in Kennebert's, who, himself a past master in the art of lying, was thinking, "'The man does not believe a word of what he is saying.' But the treasurer went on, "'I can see that even now you doubt my sincerity. Does my lord desire that his handmaiden should be blunt? Well, I know that there is no truth in what you say.' Oh, I can see that you imagine that among the distractions of the world I have kept no memory of you, and have found consolation in the love of less obdurate fair ones. I have not broken in on your retirement, I have not shadowed your steps, I have not kept watch on your actions, I have not surrounded you with spies who would perhaps have brought me the assurance, if she quitted the world which outraged her, she was not driven forth by an impulse of wounded pride or noble indignation, she did not even seek to punish those who misunderstood her by her absence, she buried herself where she was unknown, that she might indulge in stolen loves. Such were the thoughts that came to me, and yet I respected your hiding-place, and to-day I am ready to believe you true if you will merely say, I love no one else. Jeannin, who was as fat as a stage financier, paused here to gasp, for the utterance of this string of banalities, this rigmarole of commonplaces, had left him breathless. He was very much dissatisfied with his performance, and ready to curse his barren imagination. He longed to hit upon swelling phrases and natural and touching gestures, but in vain. He could only look at Mademoiselle de Guerchi with a miserable, heartbroken air. 
she remained quietly seated, with the same expression of incredulity on her features. But this one assurance that I ask, you will not give. So what I have been told is true. You have given your love to him. She could not check a startled movement. You see, it is only when I speak of him that I can overcome in you the insensibility which is killing me. My suspicions were true, after all. You deceived me for his sake. Oh, the instinctive feeling of jealousy was right which forced me to quarrel with that man, to reject the perfidious friendship which he tried to force upon me. He has returned to town, and we shall meet, but why do I say returned? Perhaps he only pretended to go away, and safe in this retreat has flouted with impunity my despair and braved my vengeance. Up to this the lady had played a waiting game, but now she grew quite confused, trying to discover the thread of the treasurer's thoughts. To whom did he refer? The Duc de Vitry? That had been her first impression. But the Duke had only been acquainted with her for a few months, since she had left court. He could not therefore have excited the jealousy of her whilom lover, and if it were not he, to whom did the words about rejecting perfidious friendship and returned to town, and so on, apply? Gena defined her embarrassment, and was not a little proud of the tactics which would, he was almost sure, force her to expose herself. For there are certain women who can be thrown into cruel perplexity by speaking to them of their love passages without affixing a proper name-label to each. They are placed, as it were, on the edge of an abyss, and forced to feel their way in darkness. To say, you have loved, almost obliges them to ask, whom? Nevertheless, this was not the word uttered by Mademoiselle de Guerchi when she ran through in her head a list of possibilities. Her answer was, "'Your language astonishes me. I don't understand what you mean.' The ice was broken, and the treasurer made a plunge. Seizing one of Angelique's hands, he asked, "'Have you never seen Commander de Jarre since then?' "'Commander de Jarre?' exclaimed Angelique. Can you swear to me, Angelique, that you love him not? Mon Dieu, what put it into your head that I ever cared for him? It's over four months since I saw him last, and I hadn't an idea whether he was alive or dead. So he has been out of town? That's the first I heard of it. My fortune is yours, Angelique. Oh, assure me once again that you do not love him that you never loved him he pleaded in a faltering voice fixing a look of painful anxiety upon her he had no intention of putting her out of countenance by the course he took he knew quite well that a woman like angelique is never more at her ease when she has a chance of telling an untruth of this nature besides he had prefaced this appeal by the magic words my fortune is yours, and the hope thus aroused was well worth a perjury. So she answered boldly, and in a steady voice, while she looked straight into his eyes, Never! I believe you, exclaimed Genin, going down on his knees and covering with his kisses the hand that he still held. I can taste happiness again. Listen, Angelique, I am leaving Paris. My mother is dead, and I am going back to Spain. Will you follow me thither? I follow you? I hesitated long before finding you out. So much did I fear a repulse. I set out to-morrow. Quit Paris, leave the world which has slandered you, and come with me. In a fortnight we shall be man and wife." "'You are not in earnest. May I expire at your feet if I am not. 
Do you want me to sign the oath with my blood?' rise she said in a broken voice have i at last found a man to love me and compensate me for all the abuse that has been showered on my head a thousand times i thank you not for what you are doing for me but for the balm you pour on my wounded spirit even if you were to say to me now after all i am obliged to give you up the pleasure of knowing you esteem me would make up for all the rest. It would be another happy memory to treasure, along with my memory of our love, which was ineffaceable, although you so ungratefully suspected me of having deceived you. The treasurer appeared fairly intoxicated with joy. He indulged in a thousand ridiculous extravagances and exaggerations, and declared himself the happiest of men. Mademoiselle de Guerchi, who was desirous of being prepared for every peril, asked him in a coaxing tone, "'Who can have put it into your head to be jealous of the commander? Has he been base enough to boast that I never gave him my love?' "'No, he never said anything about you, but some way I was afraid.' She renewed her assurances. The conversation continued some time in a sentimental tone. A thousand oaths, a thousand protestations of love were exchanged. Jeannin feared that the suddenness of their journey would inconvenience his mistress, and offered to put it off for some days. But to this she would not consent, and it was arranged that the next day at noon a carriage should call at the house and take Angelique out of town to an appointed place at which the treasurer was to join her. Maître Quennebert, eye and ear on the alert, had not lost a word of this conversation, and the last proposition of the treasurer changed his ideas. Pardieu, he said to himself, it looks as if this good man were really going to let himself be taken in and done for. It is singular how very clear-sighted we can be about things that don't touch us. This poor fly is going to let himself be caught by a very clever spider, or I'm much mistaken. Very likely my widow is quite of my opinion, and yet in what concerns herself she will remain stone-blind. Well, such is life. We have only two parts to choose between— we must be either knave or fool. What's Madame Rapailly doing, I wonder? At this moment he heard a stifled whisper from the opposite corner of the room, but protected by the distance and the darkness, he let the widow murmur on, and applied his eye once more to his peephole. What he saw confirmed his opinion. The damsel was springing up and down, laughing, gesticulating, and congratulating herself on her unexpected good fortune. "'Just imagine, he loves me like that,' she was saying to herself. "'Poor Genin! When I remember how I used to hesitate, how fortunate that Commander de Jarre, one of the most vain and indiscreet of men, never babbled about me! Yes, we must leave town to-morrow without fail. I must not give him time to be enlightened by a chance word. But the Duc de Vitry, I am really sorry for him. However, why did he go away and send no word? And then he's a married man. Ah, if I could only get back again to court some day. Who would ever have expected such a thing? Good God, I must keep talking to myself to be sure I'm not dreaming. Yes, he was there just now at my feet, saying to me, Angelique, you are going to become my wife. One thing is sure, he may safely entrust his honour to my care. It would be infamous to betray a man who loves me as he does, who will give me his name. Never, no, never will I give him cause to reproach me. I would rather— A loud and confused noise on the stairs interrupted this soliloquy. At one moment bursts of laughter were heard, and the next angry voices. 
then a loud exclamation, followed by a short silence. Being alarmed at this disturbance in a house which was usually so quiet, Mademoiselle de Guetchi approached the door of her room, intending either to call for protection or to lock herself in, when suddenly it was violently pushed open. She recoiled with fright, exclaiming, "'Commander de Jarre!' "'On my word,' said Guenebert behind the arras, "'tis as amusing as a play. Is the commander also going to offer to make an honest woman of her? But what do I see?' He had just caught sight of the young man on whom de Jarre had bestowed the title and name of Chevalier de Morange, and whose acquaintance the reader has already made at the tavern in the Rue saint andre des Arts. His appearance had as great an effect on the notary as a thunderbolt. He stood motionless, trembling, breathless, his knees ready to give way beneath him, everything black before his eyes. However, he soon pulled himself together, and succeeded in overcoming the effects of his surprise and terror. He looked once more through the hole in the partition, and became so absorbed that no one in the whole world could have got a word from him just then. The devil himself might have shrieked into his ears unheeded, and a naked sword suspended over his head would not have induced him to change his place. End of section 16 Reading by Tom Denham Section 17 Celebrated Crimes, Volume 5 by Alexander Dumas This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tom Denham Celebrated Crimes, Volume 5, by Alexander Dumas, Section 17, La Constantin, Chapter 4 Before Mademoiselle de Guerchi had recovered from her fright, the commander spoke. "'As I am a gentleman, my beauty, if you were the abbess of Montmartre, you could not be more difficult of access. I met a blackguard on the stairs who tried to stop me, and whom I was obliged to thrash soundly. Is what they told me on my return true? Are you really doing penance, and do you intend to take the veil?' "'Sir,' answered Angélique, with great dignity, "'whatever may be my plans, I have a right to be surprised at your violence, and at your intrusion at such an hour. "'Before we go any farther,' said de Jarre, twirling round on his heels, "'allow me to present to you my nephew, the Chevalier de Morange.' "'Chevalier de Morange?' muttered Quennebert, on whose memory, in that instant, the name became indelibly engraven. "'A young man,' continued the commander, "'who has come back with me from abroad. "'Good style, as you see, charming appearance. "'Now, you young innocent, lift up your great black eyes "'and kiss madame's hand. I allow it.' "'Monsieur le commandeur, leave my room. "'Be gone, or I shall call. "'Whom, then? Your lackeys?' but I have beaten the only one you keep, as I told you, and it will be some time before he'll be in a condition to light me downstairs. Be gone, indeed. Is that the way you receive an old friend? Pray be seated, Chevalier. He approached Mademoiselle de Guerchi, and, despite her resistance, seized hold of one of her hands, and, forcing her to sit down, seated himself beside her. "'That's right, my girl,' said he. "'Now let us talk sense. "'I understand that before a stranger "'you consider yourself obliged to appear astonished "'at my ways of going on. 
but he knows all about us, and nothing he may see or hear will surprise him. So a truce to prudery. I came back yesterday, but I could not make out your hiding-place till to-day. Now I am not going to ask you to tell me how you have gone on in my absence. God and you alone know, and while he will tell me nothing, you would only tell me fibs, and I want to save you from that venial sin at least. But here I am, in as good spirits as ever, more in love than ever, and quite ready to resume my old habits. Meantime the lady, quite subdued by his noisy entrance and ruffianly conduct, and seeing that an assumption of dignity would only draw down on her some fresh impertinence, appeared to resign herself to her position. All this time Kennebert never took his eyes from the chevalier, who sat with his face towards the partition. His elegantly cut costume accentuated his personal advantages. His jet-black hair brought into relief the whiteness of his forehead. His large, dark eyes, with their veined lids and silky lashes, had a penetrating and peculiar expression, a mixture of audacity and weakness. His thin and somewhat pale lips were apt to curl in an ironical smile. His hands were of perfect beauty, his feet of dainty smallness, and he showed with an affectation of complaisance a well-turned leg above his ample boots, the turned-down tops of which, garnished with lace, fell in irregular folds over his ankles in the latest fashion. He did not appear to be more than eighteen years of age, and nature had denied his charming face the distinctive sign of his sex, for not the slightest down was visible on his chin. Though a little delicate pencilling darkened his upper lip. His slightly effeminate style of beauty, the graceful curves of his figure, his expression, sometimes coaxing, sometimes saucy, reminding one of a page, gave him the appearance of a charming young scapegrace designed to inspire sudden passions and wayward fancies. While his pretended uncle was making himself at home most unceremoniously, Kennebert remarked that the chevalier at once began to lay siege to his fair hostess, bestowing tender and love-laden glances on her behind that uncle's back. This redoubled his curiosity. "'My dear girl,' said the commander, since I saw you last I have come into a fortune of one hundred thousand livres, neither more nor less. One of my dear aunts took it into her head to depart this life, and her temper being crotchety and spiteful, she made me her sole heir, in order to enrage those of her relatives who had nursed her in her illness. One hundred thousand livres! It's a round sum— enough to cut a great figure with for two years. If you like, we shall squander it together, capital and interest. Why do you not speak? Has any one else robbed me by any chance of your heart? If that were so, I should be in despair, upon my word, for the sake of the fortunate individual who had won your favour for I will brook no rivals, I give you fair warning. Monsieur le commandeur, answered Angelique, you forget in speaking to me in that manner, I have never given you any right to control my actions. Have we severed our connection? At this singular question, Angelique started, but de Jarre continued, when last we parted we were on the best of terms, were we not? I know that some months have elapsed since then, but I have explained to you the reason of my absence. Before filling up the blank left by the departed, we must give ourselves space to mourn. Well, was I right in my guess? Have you given me a successor? Mademoiselle de Grecci had hitherto succeeded in 
controlling her indignation, and had tried to force herself to drink the bitter cup of humiliation to the dregs. But now she could bear it no longer. Having thrown a look, expressive of her suffering, at the young chevalier, who continued to ogle her with great pertinacity, she decided on bursting into tears, and in a voice broken by sobs, she exclaimed that she was miserable at being treated in this manner, that she did not deserve it, and that heaven was punishing her for her error in yielding to the entreaties of the commander. One would have sworn she was sincere, and that the words came from her heart. If Maître Quennebert had not witnessed the scene with Jenin, if he had not known how frail was the virtue of the weeping damsel, he might have been affected by her touching plaint. The chevalier appeared to be deeply moved by Angelique's grief, and while his uncle was striding up and down the room and swearing like a trooper, he gradually approached her and expressed by signs the compassion he felt. Meantime, the notary was in a strange state of mind. He had not yet made up his mind whether the whole thing was a joke arranged between de Jarre and Genin or not. But of one thing he was quite convinced. The sympathy which Chevalier de Morange was expressing by passionate sighs and glances was the merest hypocrisy. Had he been alone, nothing would have prevented his dashing head foremost into this imbroglio in scorn of consequence, convinced that his appearance would be as terrible in its effect as the head of Medusa. But the presence of the widow restrained him. Why ruin his future and dry up the golden spring which had just begun to gush before his eyes, for the sake of taking part in a melodrama? Prudence and self-interest kept him in the side scenes. The tears of the fair one and the glances of the chevalier awoke no repentance in the breast of the commander. On the contrary, he began to vent his anger in terms still more energetic. He strode up and down the oaken floor till it shook under his spurred heels. He stuck his plumed hat on the side of his head and displayed the manners of a bully in a Spanish comedy. Suddenly, he seemed to have come to a swift resolution. The expression of his face changed from rage to icy coldness, and walking up to Angelique, he said, with a composure more terrible than the wildest fury, "'My rival's name?' "'You shall never learn it from me.' "'Madame, his name?' "'Never!' I have borne your insults too long. I am not responsible to you for my actions. Well, I shall learn it in spite of you, and I know to whom to apply. Do you think you can play fast and loose with me and my love? No, no! I used to believe in you. I turned a deaf ear to your traducers. My mad passion for you became known. I was the jest and the butt of the town. But you have opened my eyes, and at last I see clearly on whom my vengeance ought to fall. He was formerly my friend, and I would believe nothing against him. Although I was often warned, I took no notice. But now I will seek him out, and say to him, You have stolen what was mine. You are a scoundrel. It must be your life or mine and if there is justice in heaven, I shall kill him. Well, madame, you don't ask me the name of this man? You well know whom I mean. This threat brought home to Mademoiselle de Guerchi how imminent was her danger. At first she had thought the commander's visit might be a snare laid to test her, but the coarseness of his expressions— the cynicism of his overtures in the presence of a third person had convinced her she was wrong. No man could have imagined that the revolting method of seduction employed 
could meet with success, and if the commander had desired to convict her of perfidy, he would have come alone and made use of more persuasive weapons. No, he believed he still had claims on her, but even if he had, by his manner of enforcing them, he had rendered them void. However, the moment he threatened to seek out a rival whose identity he designated quite clearly, and revealed to him the secret it was so necessary to her interest to keep hidden, the poor girl lost her head. She looked at de Jarre with a frightened expression, and said in a trembling voice, "'I don't know whom you mean.' "'You don't know? Well, I shall commission the king's treasurer, Jeannin de Castille, to come here to-morrow and tell you, an hour before our duel.' "'Oh, no, no, promise me you will not do that.' cried she, clasping her hands. Adieu, madame. Do not leave me thus. I cannot let you go till you give me your promise. She threw herself on her knees and clung with both her hands to de Jars cloak, and appealing to Chevalier de Morin, said, You are young, monsieur. I have never done you any harm. Protect me. Have pity on me. Help me to soften him. Uncle, said the chevalier, in a pleading tone, be generous, and don't drive this woman to despair. Prayers are useless, answered the commander. What do you want me to do? said Angelique. Shall I go into a convent to atone? I am ready to go. Shall I promise never to see him again? For God's sake, give me a little time. Put off your vengeance for one single day. Tomorrow evening, I swear to you, you will have nothing more to fear from me. I thought myself forgotten by you and abandoned, and how should I think otherwise? You left me without a word of farewell, you stayed away and never sent me a line. And how do you know that I did not weep when you deserted me, leaving me to pass my days in monotonous solitude? How do you know that I did not make every effort to find out why you were so long absent from my side? You say you had left town, but how was I to know that? Oh, promise me, if you love me, to give up this duel— Promise me not to seek that man out to-morrow. The poor creature hoped to work wonders with her eloquence, her tears, her pleading glances. On hearing her prayer for a reprieve of twenty-four hours, swearing that she would never see Genin again, the commander and the chevalier were obliged to bite their lips to keep from laughing outright. But the former soon regained his self-possession, and while Angelique, still on her knees before him, pressed his hands to her bosom, he forced her to raise her head, and looking straight into her eyes, said, "'Tomorrow, madame, if not this evening, he shall know everything, and a meeting shall take place.' Then, pushing her away, he strode towards the door. "'Oh, how unhappy I am!' exclaimed Angelique. She tried to rise and rush after him, but whether she was really overcome by her feelings, or whether she felt the one chance of prevailing left her was to faint, she uttered a heart-rending cry, and the chevalier had no choice but to support her sinking form." De Jarre, on seeing his nephew staggering under this burden, gave a loud laugh and hurried away. Two minutes later he was once more at the tavern in the Rue Saint-André-des-Arts. "'How's this? Alone?' said Genin. "'Alone. What have you done with the chevalier?' "'I left him with our charmer, who was unconscious, overcome with grief.' exhausted. Ha, ha, ha! She felt fainting into his arms. Ha, ha, ha! 
it's quite possible that the young rogue being left with her in such a condition may cut me out do you think so <laughs> and de jars laughed so heartily and so infectiously that his worthy friend was obliged to join in and laughed till he choked in the short silence which followed the departure of the commander maitre quennebert could hear the widow still murmuring something but he was less disposed than ever to attend to her. "'On my word,' said he, "'the scene now going on is more curious than all that went before. I don't think that a man has ever found himself in such a position as mine. Although my interests demand that I remain here and listen, yet my fingers are itching to box the ears of that Chevalier de Morange if there were only some way of getting at a proof of all this. Ah, now we shall hear something. The hussy is coming to herself. And indeed, Angelique had opened her eyes, and was casting wild looks around her. She put her hand to her brow several times, as if trying to recall clearly what had happened. "'Is he gone?' she exclaimed at last. "'Oh, why did you let him go? You should not have minded me, but kept him here.' "'Be calm,' answered the chevalier. "'Be calm, for heaven's sake. I shall speak to my uncle and prevent his ruining your prospects. Only don't weep any more. Your tears break my heart. Oh, my God, how cruel it is to distress you so. I should never be able to withstand your tears.' no matter what reason I had for anger, a look from you would make me forgive you everything. "'Noble young man,' said Angelique. "'Idiot,' muttered Maître Quennebert. "'Swallow the honey of his words, do. But how the deuce is it going to end? Not Satan himself ever invented such a situation. But then I could never believe you guilty without proof, irrefutable proof, and even then a word from you would fill my mind with doubt and uncertainty again. Yes, were the whole world to accuse you and swear to your guilt, I should still believe your simple word. I am young, madame. I have never known love as yet. Until an instant ago I had no idea that more quickly than an image can excite the admiration of the eye, a thought can enter the heart and stir it to its depths, and features that one may never again behold leave a lifelong memory behind. But even if a woman, of whom I knew absolutely nothing, were to appeal to me, exclaiming, I implore your help, your protection, I should, without stopping to consider, place my sword and my arm at her disposal, and devote myself to her service. How much more eagerly would I die for you, madame, whose beauty has ravished my heart! What do you demand of me? Tell me what you desire me to do. Prevent this duel! Don't allow an interview to take place between your uncle and the man whom he mentioned. Tell me you will do this, and I shall be safe." for you have never learned to lie, I know. "'Of course he hasn't. You may be sure of that, you simpleton,' muttered Maître Quennebert in his corner. "'If you only knew what a mere novice you are at that game compared with the Chevalier, if you only knew whom you had before you!' "'At your age,' went on Angelique, "'one cannot feign—' The heart is not yet hardened, and is capable of compassion. But a dreadful idea occurs to me, a horrible suspicion. Is it all a devilish trick? A snare arranged in joke? Tell me that it is not all a pretense. A poor woman encounters so much perfidy. Men amuse themselves by troubling her heart and confusing her mind. They excite her vanity, they compass her round with homage, with flattery, with temptation, and when they grow tired of fooling her, they despise and insult her. Tell me, was this 
all a preconcerted plan? This love, this jealousy, were they only acted? Oh, madame, broke in the chevalier, with an expression of the deepest indignation, how can you for an instant imagine that a human heart could be so perverted? I am not acquainted with the man whom the commander accused you of loving, but whoever he may be, I feel sure that he is worthy of your love, and that he would never have consented to such a dastardly joke. Neither would my uncle. His jealousy mastered him and drove him mad. But I am not dependent on him. I am my own master and can do as I please. I will hinder this duel. I will not allow the illusion and ignorance of him who loves you, and alas, that I must say it, whom you love, to be dispelled, for it is in them he finds his happiness. Be happy with him. As for me, I shall never see you again. But the recollection of this meeting, the joy of having served you, will be my consolation. Angelique raised her beautiful eyes, and gave the chevalier a long look, which expressed her gratitude more eloquently than words. "'May I be hanged,' thought Maître Quennebert, "'if the baggage isn't making eyes at him already. But one who is drowning clutches at a straw.' "'Enough, madame,' said the chevalier. "'I understand all you would say. You thank me in his name, and ask me to leave you. I obey. Yes, madame, I am going. At the risk of my life I will prevent this meeting. I will stifle this fatal revelation. But grant me one last prayer. Permit me to look forward to seeing you once more before I leave this city, to which I wish I had never come. But I shall quit it in a day or two, tomorrow perhaps, as soon as I know that your happiness is assured. Oh, do not refuse my last request. Let the light of your eyes shine on me for the last time. After that I shall depart. I shall fly far away for ever. But if, perchance, in spite of every effort, I fail, if the commander's jealousy should make him impervious to my entreaties, to my tears, if he whom you love should come and overwhelm you with reproaches, and then abandon you. Would you drive me from your presence if I should then say, I love you? Answer me, I beseech you. Go, said she, and prove worthy of my gratitude. Oh, my love! Seizing one of her hands, the chevalier covered it with passionate kisses. "'Such barefaced impudence surpasses everything I could have imagined,' murmured Kennebert. "'Fortunately, the play is over for tonight. "'If it had gone on any longer, I should have done something foolish. "'The lady hardly imagines what the end of the comedy will be.' "'Neither did Kennebert. "'It was an evening of adventures. "'It was written that in the space of two hours— Angelique was to run the gamut of all the emotions, experience all the vicissitudes to which a life such as she led is exposed. Hope, fear, happiness, mortification, falsehood, love that was no love, intrigue within intrigue, and to crown all a totally unexpected conclusion. End of section 17 Reading by Tom Denham Section 18 of Celebrated Crimes, Volume 5, by Alexander Dumas This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tom Denham Celebrated Crimes, Volume 5, by Alexander Dumas, Section 18, La Constantin, Chapter 5 The Chevalier was still holding Angelique's hand, when a step resounded outside, 
and a voice was heard. "'Can it be that he has come back?' exclaimed the damsel, hastily freeing herself from the passionate embrace of the chevalier. "'It's not possible! Mon Dieu! Mon Dieu! It's his voice!' She grew pale to the lips, and stood staring at the door with outstretched arms, unable to advance or recede. The chevalier listened, but felt sure the approaching voice belonged neither to the commander nor to the treasurer. "'His voice?' thought Quennebert to himself. "'Can this be yet another aspirant to her favour? The sound came nearer. "'Hide yourself!' said Angelique, pointing to a door opposite to the partition behind which the widow and the notary were ensconced. "'Hide yourself there! There's a secret staircase. You can get out that way.' "'I hide myself?' exclaimed Morange, with a swaggering air. "'What are you thinking of? I remain.' It would have been better for him to have followed her advice, as may very well have occurred to the youth two minutes later, as a tall, muscular young man entered in a state of intense excitement. Angelique rushed to meet him, crying, "'Ah, Monsieur le Duc, is it you?' "'What is this I hear, Angelique?' said the Duc de Vitry. "'I was told below that three men had visited you this evening, but only two have gone out. Where is the third? Ha! I do not need long to find him,' he added, as he caught sight of the chevalier, who stood his ground bravely enough. "'In heaven's name!' cried Angelique. "'In heaven's name, listen to me!' "'No, no, not a word. Just now I am not questioning you.' "'Who are you, sir?' The chevalier's teasing and bantering disposition made him even at that critical moment insensible to fear, so he retorted insolently, "'Whoever I please to be, sir, and on my word I find the tone in which you put your question delightfully amusing.' The duke sprang forward in a rage, laying his hand on his sword. Angelique, tried in vain to restrain him. "'You want to screen him from my vengeance, you false one!' said he, retreating a few steps, so as to guard the door. "'Defend your life, sir! Do you defend yours?' Both drew at the same moment. Two shrieks followed, one in the room, the other behind the tapestry, for neither Angelique nor the widow had been able to restrain her alarm as the two swords flashed in air. In fact, the latter had been so frightened that she fell heavily to the floor in a faint. This incident probably saved the young man's life. His blood had already begun to run cold at the sight of his adversary, foaming with rage and standing between him and the door, when the noise of the fall distracted the duke's attention. "'What was that?' he cried. "'Are there other enemies concealed here, too?' And forgetting that he was leaving a way of escape free, he rushed in the direction from which the sound came, and lunged at the tapestry-covered partition with his sword. Meantime the chevalier, dropping all his airs of bravado, sprang from one end of the room to the other like a cat pursued by a dog. But rapid as were his movements, the duke perceived his flight, and dashed after him at the risk of breaking both his own neck and the chevalier's by a chase through unfamiliar rooms and downstairs which were plunged in darkness. All this took place in a few seconds, like a flash of lightning. Twice, with hardly any interval, the street door opened and shut noisily, and the two enemies were in the street, one pursued and the other pursuing. "'My God! Just to think of all that has happened is enough to make one die of fright,' said Mademoiselle de Guetchy. "'What will come next, I should like to know? And what shall I say to the Duke when he comes back?' Just at this instant a loud cracking sound was heard in the room. Angelique stood still, once more struck with terror and recollecting the cry she had heard. 
Her hair, which was already loosened, escaped entirely from its bonds, and she felt it rise on her head as the figures on the tapestry moved and bent towards her. Falling on her knees and closing her eyes, she began to invoke the aid of God and all the saints. But she soon felt herself raised by strong arms, and looking round she found herself in the presence of an unknown man, who seemed to have issued from the ground or the walls, and who, seizing the only light left unextinguished in the scuffle, dragged her more dead than alive into the next room. This man was, as the reader will have already guessed, Maître Quennebert. As soon as the chevalier and the duke had disappeared, the notary had run towards the corner where the widow lay, and having made sure that she was really unconscious, and unable to see or hear anything, so that it would be quite safe to tell her any story he pleased next day, he returned to his former position, and applying his shoulder to the partition, easily succeeded in freeing the ends of the rotten laths from the nails which held there, and pushing them before him, made an aperture large enough to allow of his passing through into the next apartment. He applied himself to this task with such vigour, and became so absorbed in its accomplishment, that he entirely forgot the bag of twelve hundred livres which the widow had given him. "'Who are you? What do you want with me?' cried Mademoiselle de Guerchy, struggling to free herself. "'Silence!' was Kennebert's answer. "'Don't kill me, for pity's sake! Who wants to kill you? But be silent! I don't want your shrieks to call people here. I must be alone with you for a few moments. Once more I tell you to be quiet, unless you want me to use violence.' If you do what I tell you, no harm shall happen to you. But who are you, monsieur? I am neither a burglar nor a murderer. That's all you need to know. The rest is no concern of yours. Have you writing materials at hand? Yes, monsieur, there they are, on that table. Very well. Now sit down at the table. Why? Sit down and answer my questions. The first man who visited you this evening was Monsieur Genin, was he not? Yes, Monsieur Genin de Castille. The king's treasurer? Yes. All right. The second was Commander de Jarre, and the young man he brought with him was his nephew, the Chevalier de Morange. The last comer was a duke, am I not right? The Duc de Vitry. Now, write from my dictation. He spoke very slowly, and Mademoiselle de Guerchi, obeying his commands, took up her pen. Today, dictated Kennebert, today, this twentieth day of the month of November, in the year of the Lord, 1658, I. What is your full name? Angelique Louise de Grecci. Go on. I, Angelique Louise de Grecci, was visited in the rooms which I occupy in the mansion of the Duchesse des Tempes, corner of the streets Gilles Le Coeur and du Hourpois, about half past seven in the evening, in the first place, by Monsieur Genin de Castille, King's Treasurer. In the second place, by Commander de Jarre, who was accompanied by a young man, his nephew, the Chevalier de Morange. In the third place, after the departure of Commander de Jarre, and while I was alone with the Chevalier de Morange, by the Duc de Vitry, who drew his sword upon the said Chevalier and forced him to take flight. Now, Put in a line by itself, and use capitals. Description of the Chevalier de Morange. But I only saw him for an instant, said Angelique, and I can't recall. Write, and don't talk. I can recall everything, and that is all that is wanted. Height, about five feet. 
"'The chevalier,' said Quennebert, interrupting himself, "'is four feet eleven inches, three lines and a half. "'But I don't need absolute exactness.' Angélique gazed at him in utter stupefaction. "'Do you know him, then?' she asked. "'I saw him this evening for the first time, but my eye is very accurate. "'Height about five feet. "'Hair black, eyes ditto, nose aquiline, mouth large, lips compressed, forehead high, face oval, complexion pale, no beard. Now another line, and in capitals, special marks. A small mole on the neck, behind the right ear, a smaller mole on the left hand. Have you written that? Now sign it with your full name. What use are you going to make of this paper? I should have told you before, if I had desired you to know. Any questions are quite useless. I don't enjoin secrecy on you, however, added the notary, as he folded the paper and put it into his doublet pocket. You are quite free to tell anyone you like that you have written the description of the Chevalier de Morange at the dictation of an unknown man who got into your room you don't know how, by the chimney or through the ceiling perhaps, but who was determined to leave it by a more convenient road. Is there not a secret staircase? Show me where it is. I don't want to meet anyone on my way out. Angélique pointed out a door to him, hidden by a damask curtain and Quennebert, saluting her, opened it and disappeared, leaving Angélique convinced that she had seen the devil in person. Not until the next day did the sight of the displaced partition explain the apparition, but even then so great was her fright, so deep was the terror which the recollection of the mysterious man inspired, that despite the permission to tell what had happened, she mentioned her adventure to no one, and did not even complain to her neighbour, Madame Rapailly, of the inquisitiveness which had led the widow to spy on her actions. End of section 18 Recording by Tom Denham Celebrated Crimes, Volume 5, by Alexander Dumas. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tom Denham. Celebrated Crimes, Volume 5, by Alexander Dumas. Section 19. La Constantin, Chapter 6. We left de Jarre and Genin roaring with laughter in the tavern in the Rue Saint-André-des-Arts. What? said the treasurer. Do you really think that Angélique thought I was in earnest in my offer? That she believes in all good faith I intended to marry her? You may take my word for it. If it were not so, do you imagine she would have been in such desperation? Would she have fainted at my threat to tell you that I had claims on her as well as you? To get married? Why, that is the goal of all such creatures, and there is not one of them who can understand why a man of honour should blush to give her his name. If you had only seen her terror, her tears, they would have either broken your heart or killed you with laughter. Well, said Genin, it is getting late. Are we going to wait for the chevalier? Let us call for him. Very well. Perhaps he has made up his mind to stay. If so, we shall make a horrible scene, cry treachery and perjury, and trounce your nephew well. Let's settle our score and be off. They left the wine-shop, 
both rather the worse for the wine they had so largely indulged in. They felt the need of the cool night air, so instead of going down the Rue Pavé, they resolved to follow the Rue saint andre des Arts as far as the Pont Saint-Michel, so as to reach the mansion by a longer route. At the very moment the commander got up to leave the tavern, the chevalier had run out of the mansion at the top of his speed. It was not that he had entirely lost his courage, for had he found it impossible to avoid his assailant, it is probable that he would have regained the audacity which had led him to draw his sword. But he was a novice in the use of arms, had not reached full physical development, and felt that the chances were so much against him that he would only have faced the encounter if there were no possible way of escape. On leaving the house, he had turned quickly into the Rue Gilles de Coeur, but on hearing the door close behind his pursuer, he disappeared down the narrow and crooked Rue de l'Hirondelle, hoping to throw the Duc de Vitry off the scent. The Duke, however, though for a moment in doubt, was guided by the sound of the flying footsteps. The Chevalier, still trying to send him off on a false trail, turned to the right, and so regained the upper end of the Rue Saint-André, and ran along it as far as the church, the site of which is occupied by the square of the same name today. Here he thought he would be safe, for, as the church was being restored and enlarged, heaps of stone stood all round the old pile. He glided in among these, and twice heard Vitry searching quite close to him, and each time stood on guard, expecting an onslaught. This marching and counter-marching lasted for some minutes. The chevalier began to hope that he had escaped the danger, and, and eagerly waited for the moment when the moon, which had broken through the clouds, should again withdraw behind them, in order to steal into some of the adjacent streets under cover of the darkness. Suddenly a shadow rose before him, and a threatening voice cried, "'Have I caught you at last, you coward!' The danger in which the chevalier stood awoke in him a flickering energy, a feverish courage, and he crossed blades with his assailant. A strange combat ensued, of which the result was quite uncertain, depending entirely on chance for no science was of any avail on a ground so rough that the combatants stumbled at every step, or struck against immovable masses, which were one moment clearly lit up, and the next in shadow. Steel clashed on steel, the feet of the adversaries touched each other, several times the cloak of one was pierced by the sword of the other, more than once the words, "'Die, then!' rang out but each time the seemingly vanquished combatant sprang up unwounded, as agile and as lithe and as quick as ever, while he in his turn pressed the enemy home. There was neither truce nor pause, no clever feints nor fencer's tricks could be employed on either side. It was a mortal combat, but chance, not skill, would deal the death-blow. Sometimes a rapid pass encountered only empty air, sometimes blade crossed blade above the wielders' heads, sometimes the fencers lunged at each other's breast, and yet the blows glanced aside at the last moment, and the blades met in air once more. At last, however, one of the two, making a pass to the right which left his breast unguarded, received a deep wound. Uttering a loud cry, he recoiled a step or two, but exhausted by the effort, tripped and fell backward over a large stone, and lay there motionless, his arms extended in the form of a cross. The other turned and fled. "'Hark, Dejar,' said Genin, stopping, "'there's fighting going on hereabouts. I hear the clash of swords.' 
both listened intently. "'I hear nothing now.' "'Hush, there it goes again. It's by the church.' "'What a dreadful cry!' They ran at full speed towards the place whence it seemed to come, but found only solitude, darkness, and silence. They looked in every direction. "'I can't see a living soul,' said Jeannin, "'and I very much fear that the poor devil who gave that yell has mumbled his last prayer.' "'I don't know why I tremble so,' replied de Jarre. "'That heart-rending cry made me shiver from head to foot. "'Was it not something like the Chevalier's voice?' "'The Chevalier is with La Guerchi, "'and even if she, he had left her, "'this would not have been his way to rejoin us. "'Let us go on and leave the dead in peace.' "'Look, Chenin, what is that in front of us?' "'On that stone, a man who has fallen!' "'Yes, and bathed in blood!' exclaimed de Jean, who had darted to his side. "'Ah, it's he! It's he! Look, his eyes are closed, his hands cold! My child, he does not hear me! Oh, who has murdered him?' He fell on his knees, and threw himself on the body, with every mark of the most violent despair. "'Come, come!' said Jeannin surprised at such an explosion of grief from a man accustomed to duels, and who on several similar occasions had been far from displaying much tenderness of heart. Collect yourself, and don't give way like a woman. Perhaps the wound is not mortal. Let us try to stop the bleeding and call for help. No, no! Are you mad? Don't call, for heaven's sake! The wound is here, near the heart. Your handkerchief Jeannin to arrest the flow of blood. There, now help me to lift him. What does that mean? cried Jeannin, who had just laid his hand on the chevalier. I don't know whether I'm awake or asleep. Why, it's a— Be silent! On your life I shall explain everything, but now be silent. There is someone looking at us. There was indeed a man, wrapped in a mantle, standing motionless some steps away. "'What are you doing here?' asked de Jean. "'May I ask what you are doing, gentlemen?' retorted Maître Quennebert, in a calm and steady voice. "'Your curiosity may cost you dear, monsieur. We are not in the habit of allowing our actions to be spied on. And I am not in the habit of running useless risks.' most noble cavaliers. You are, it is true, two against one. But, he added, throwing back his cloak and grasping the hilts of a pair of pistols tucked in his belt, these will make us equal. You are mistaken as to my intentions. I had no thought of playing the spy. It was chance alone that led me here, and you must acknowledge that finding you in this lonely spot engaged as you are at this hour of the night, was quite enough to awake the curiosity of a man as little disposed to provoke a quarrel as to submit to threats. "'It was chance also that brought us here. We were crossing the square, my friend and I, when we heard groans. We followed the sound and found this young gallant, who is a stranger to us, lying here with a wound in his breast.' As the moon at that moment gleamed doubtfully forth, Maître Quennebert bent for an instant over the body of the wounded man, and said, "'I know him more than you, but supposing someone were to come upon us here, we might easily be taken for three assassins, holding a consultation over the corpse of our victim. What were you going to do?' "'Take him to a doctor.' It would be inhuman to leave him here, and while we are talking, precious time is being lost. Do you belong to this neighbourhood? No, said the treasurer. Neither do I, said Kennebert, but I believe I have heard the name of a surgeon who lives close by, in the Rue Hauteville. I also know of one, interposed de Jarre, a very skilful man. You may command me. 
"'Gladly, monsieur, for he lives some distance from here. "'I am at your service.' De Jarre and Genin raised the chevalier's shoulders, and the stranger supported his legs, and carrying their burden in this order, they set off. They walked slowly, looking about them carefully, a precaution rendered necessary by the fact that the moon now rode in a cloudless sky. They glided over the Pont Saint-Michel between the houses that lined both sides, and, turning to the right, entered one of the narrow streets of the Cité, and after many turnings, during which they met no one, they stopped at the door of a house situated behind the Hôtel de Ville. "'Many thanks, monsieur,' said de Jean, "'many thanks. We need no further help. As the commander spoke, Maître Quennebert let the feet of the chevalier fall abruptly on the pavement, while de Jarre and the treasurer still supported his body. And stepping back two paces, he drew his pistols from his belt, and placing a finger on each trigger, said, "'Do not stir, monsieur, or you are dead men.' Both, although encumbered by their burden, laid their hands upon their swords. Not a movement, not a sound, or I shoot. There was no reply to this argument, it being a convincing one even for two duelists. The bravest man turns pale when he finds himself face to face with sudden inevitable death, and he who threatened seemed to be one who would, without hesitation, carry out his threats. There was nothing for it but obedience, or a ball through them as they stood. "'What do you want with us, sir?' asked Genin. Kennebert, without changing his attitude, replied, "'Commander de Jarre, and you, Monsieur Genin de Castile, King's treasurer, you see, my gentles, that besides the advantage of arms, which strike swiftly and surely, I have the further advantage of knowing who you are. Whilst I am myself unknown, you will carry the wounded man into this house, into which I will not enter, for I have nothing to do within. But I shall remain here to await your return. After you have handed over the patient to the doctor, you will procure paper and write, now pay great attention, that on November 20th, 1658, about midnight, you, aided by an unknown man, carried to this house, the address of which you will give, a young man whom you call the Chevalier de Morange, and pass off as your nephew, as he really is, very well. But who told you? Let me go on. Who had been wounded in a fight with swords on the same night, behind the church of saint andre des arts by the Duc de Vitry. The Duc de Vitry? How do you know that? No matter how, I know it for a fact. Having made this declaration, you will add that the said Chevalier de Morange is no other than Josephine Charlotte Boulenois, whom you, Commander, abducted four months ago from the convent of La Raquette, whom you have made your mistress, and whom you conceal disguised as a man. Then you will add your signature. Is my information correct? De Jarre and Genin were speechless with surprise for a few instants. Then the former stammered, w w "'Will you tell us who you are?' "'The devil in person, if you like.' "'Well, will you do as I order? Supposing that I am awkward enough not to kill you at two paces, do you want me to ask you in broad daylight, and aloud, what I now ask at night and in a whisper?' and don't think to put me off with a false declaration. 
relying on my not being able to read it by the light of the moon, don't think either that you can take me by surprise when you hand it to me. You will bring it to me with your sword's sheath does now. If this condition is not observed, I shall fire, and the noise will bring a crowd about us. Tomorrow I shall speak differently from today. I shall proclaim the truth at all the street corners, in the squares and under the windows of the Louvre. It is hard, I know, for men of spirit to yield to threats, but recollect that you are in my power, and there is no disgrace in paying a ransom for a life that one cannot defend. What do you say? In spite of his natural courage, Jeannin, who found himself involved in an affair from which he had nothing to gain, and who was not at all desirous of being suspected of having helped in an abduction, whispered to the commander, "'Faith, I think our wisest course is to consent.' De Jarre, however, before replying, wished to try if he could by any chance throw his enemy off his guard for an instant, so as to take him unawares. His hand still rested on the hilt of his sword, motionless, but ready to draw. "'There's someone coming over yonder,' he cried. "'Do you hear?' "'You can't catch me in that way,' said Quennevere. "'Even were there any one coming, I should not look around, and if you move your hand, all is over with you.' "'Well,' said Genin, "'I surrender at discretion. "'Not on my own account, "'but out of regard for my friend and this woman. "'However, we are entitled to some pledge of your silence. "'This statement that you demand once written, "'you can ruin us to-morrow by its means. "'I don't yet know what use I shall make of it, gentlemen. "'Make up your minds.' or you will have nothing but a dead body to place in the doctor's hands. There is no escape for you. For the first time the wounded man faintly groaned. "'I must save her,' cried de Jean. "'I yield, and I swear upon my honour that I will never try to get this woman out of your hands.' and that I will never interfere with your conquest. Knock, gentlemen, and remain as long as may be necessary. I am patient. Pray to God, if you will, that she may recover. My one desire is that she may die. They entered the house, and Quennebert, wrapping himself once more in his mantle, walked up and down before it, stopping to listen from time to time. In about two hours the commander and the treasurer came out again, and handed him a written paper in the manner agreed on. "'I greatly fear that it will be a certificate of death,' said de Jean. "'Heaven grant it, commander. Adieu, messieurs.' He then withdrew, walking backwards, keeping the two friends covered with his pistols, until he had placed a sufficient distance between himself and them to be out of danger of an attack. The two gentlemen, on their part, walked rapidly away, looking round from time to time, and keeping their ears open. They were very much mortified at having been forced to let a mere boor dictate to them, and anxious, especially de Jean, as to the result of the wound. End of section 19